The northwestern state of Punjab in India is lovingly referred to as the land of five rivers and the food bowl of India. It is also the state that has been home to many reverential gurus and esteemed Sufi poets. Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism and the first of the ten gurus of the faith, was born in undivided Punjab. The holy city of Amritsar, which is regarded as an important pilgrimage center for the followers of Sikhism, is also located in this state. People of all faiths continue to visit the holy city of Amritsar and the Golden Temple in large numbers every day. ਜੱਲੇ ਵਾਲੇ ਬਾਗ ਦਾ ਨਾਮ ਜੱਲਾ ਜ਼ਿਮੀਦਾਰ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਸ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਪੈਲੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਬਾਗ ਲਗਾਇਆ ਉਸ ਬਾਗ ਦਾ ਨਾਮ ਬਾਅਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਜੱਲੇ ਵਾਲਾ ਬਾਗ ਪੈ ਗਿਆ ਜਦ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਦੀ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਨੇ ਆਣ ਕੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਰਾਜ ਕੀਤਾ ਅੰਗਰੇਜ਼ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਆਈ ਤਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੇ ਅੰਡਰ ਕਰ ਲਿਆ ਇੱਕ ਦਿਨ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਨੂੰ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਕੋਲ ਮੁਕਤ ਕਰਾਉਣ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਜੋ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਸੱਦੀ ਗਈ ਉਹ ਜੱਲੇ ਵਾਲੇ ਬਾਗ ਵਿੱਚ ਸੱਦੀ ਗਈ ਉਨ ਕੇ ਅੰਦਰ ਮੇ ਘੁਸ ਚੁਕਾ ਹੈ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਫਰਮ ਮਾਈ ਸਿੰਸ ਮਾਈ ਚਾਈਲਡਹੂਡ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਹਰਡ ਦਾ ਸਟੋਰੀ ਫਰਮ ਮਾਈ ਗ੍ਰੈਂਡਫਾਦਰ ਮਾਈ ਫਾਦਰ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਹਰਡ ਦਾ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਮਾਈ ਗ੍ਰੈਂਡਫਾਦਰ ਟੋਲਡ ਮੀ ਥੈਟ ਹਾਊ ਹੀ ਐਸਕੇਪਡ ਬਾਈ ਹਾਈਡਿੰਗ ਹਿਮਸੈਲਫ ਬਿਨੀਥ ਥੈਟ ਔਰ ਅੰਡਰ ਥੈਟ ਡਾਇਸ ਐਂਡ ਮਾਈ ਫਾਦਰ ਵਾਜ ਅ ਬੋਏ ਆਫ 10 ਔਰ 12 ਐਟ ਥੈਟ ਟਾਈਮ and my father told that he went inside the jallianwala bag with his some of his friends to search and somebody told oh fer aa gaya fer aa gaya fer aa gaya means again the general dire has again come general dire has again come that we ran away from that due to um, either curiosity or due to panic they ran away jab the 1919 mein वहां पर जो साका हुआ उस समय काफी लोग शहीद हुए सभी धर्मों के लोग शहीद हुए उसी में ही हमारे गांव पिंड शाम नगर ब्लॉक मजीठा डिस्ट्रिक्ट अमृतसर के रहने वाला मेरा मेरे परिवार सिद्धू परिवार के बड़े लोग भाई साहब भाई बक्सी सिंह जी सिद्धू जो इसी में शहीद हुए थे और ये मैं फख्र महसूस करता हूं मेरे नगर में ऐसे इंसान पैदा हुए जिन्होंने इस देश के लिए आहुति दी हमको बहुत गर्व है हमको बहुत मान है इन चीजों के my grandfather expired in the year 1962 then my father in the year 88 i was a boy i was rather a joint jallianwala bag most probably in the year 77 or 78 the tragedy of jallianwala bag in 1919 is a shameful scar on british indian history We deeply regret what happened and the suffering caused. November 11, 1918. the day that witnessed the declaration of the end of the first world war a period that was marked by incessant and violent conflicts massive destruction of assets and resources and loss of countless innocent lives the indian soldiers who were part of this war were on their way back home
Punjab was passing through a very difficult time at the end of the 1918-1919 because war, First World War had really impacted it in a great way. One, there was large scale recruitment from Punjab uh, during the war period. Uh, if there were 10 lakh soldiers were mobilized from India, 5 lakhs belonged to Punjab only. And then there were forcible recruitments from the villages of Punjab. The entire question of reward. There was a feeling that the Indians had sacrificed their blood for the Union Jack and that much of the uh, the British as success in the First World War uh, was all could be written in terms of success of in terms of uh, success of Indian involvement. But that was not really given much recognition. That is what the Indians felt. And rather than expecting prizes and rewards from the British, what essentially came was punishment or retribution. The First World War, as you know, was ended by the Treaty of Versailles. And the Treaty of Versailles was based on the 14 points of President Wilson. And one of the cardinal points of the elements in the 14 points was the right of self-determination. So therefore, a question arose amongst a broad sections of the educated Indian opinion if the right to self-determination could be granted to sections of European countries, why India should be debarred of it? If democracy can flourish in Britain, why the same country can be allowed to behave in the most undemocratic manner in its colonies? And then the people, the soldiers who were coming from Europe, they brought with them this epidemic of influenza. Influenza and cholera in just 1918 killed about 1.2 million people. That's 12 lakhs is a huge number for those days. Even it would be today also in this big population. So all these factors had made people very, very miserable. There was no work, large scale unemployment. Wages were not increasing. Uh, two to three times uh, rise in prices. Uh, people were looking for something. Leaders like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai, Bipin Chandrapal, Chitranjan Dash, Annie Besant, Lal Bahadur Shastri, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya and few others were some of the most prominent names in the political domain at this time. On March 10, the Rowlett Bills were passed as the Anarchical and Revolutionary Crimes Act of 1919. And these were registered on March 18, 1919 at the Legislative Council of India under the chairmanship of Lord Clemsford. The Rowlett Act, it actually prevented people from congregating uh, in large numbers. There could be house arrests without warrants. There could be, any person could be jailed for minimum six months. And this was a black act in every respect because uh, it opened this entire idea that people could be forcibly detained without any possible cause. And because of this uh, sort of act being based on sheer suspicion on the part of the British rulers, Indian nationalists felt that it was uh, it was not really an act in the sense, but more of uh, a sort of an, an act which paved the way for military or police intervention in civilian life. Here comes Gandhi. And Gandhi, because of his foresight, because of the fact that he could win over a broad section of the South Africans, Indians as well as Africans for fighting a just political cause through his, through his unique uh, instrument of weapon of Shotagra and non-violence, passive resistance. This particular emergence of a new form of politics in India against the British alarmed the British Raj. And at a time when already as a result of the First World War, a uh, sense of nationalism had been generated. At the same time, shortly after the 
towards the time when the war was being ended war was be coming to an end the emergence of gandhi posed the british with a new form of nationalist challenge and therefore the british wanted to nip in bud this particular political danger that they were anticipating that they were seeing and it was in this context that the rawlat act was promulgated which sought to strike at the basic civil rights and liberties of the ordinary people so that the indians could not have a space to voice their own political discontent against the british or to organize themselves against the british the indian national congress decided to protest against the passing of this bill and gandhi ji decreed that on march 30th satyagraha or passive political resistance will be observed throughout the country it was decided that the people of the country will leave their chores suspend all businesses in order to fast and pray this peaceful amicable program was the first step that was taken towards uniting the people of this country soon after the date of satyagraha was changed from march 30th to april 6th protests and strikes broke out in lahore amritsar calcutta delhi ahmedabad and in many other parts of the country on 6th april lieutenant governor of punjab michael odaya had also tried to stop the satyagraha meetings on april 6th he had issued a warning to the leaders of the satyagraha movement announced that any such gathering and procession will be deemed as illegal and those breaking the law will have to face severe punishment but the people did not pay any heed to these warnings they did not get scared of him when these uh, rollet bills come it gives them a point to protest because uh, uh, against those bills some of the local leaders in amritsar uh, dr saifuddin kichlu dr satyawal they were very young at that time they started organizing meetings in fact they had organized earlier a meeting against the availability of railway platform tickets and that was very successful agitation Uh, so they started organizing against the bills in fact they were organizing uh, meetings against the bills uh, before mahatma gandhi gave call on 24th of february april 9 1919 the day of ram navami festival in amritsar the entire city was all decked up to celebrate it with fervor This festival had adverse effect on the British government and increased its blood pressure simply because it had strengthened the bonds of friendship and unity between the Hindus and Muslims in Amritsar. The harmony and brotherhood between the members of these two communities had in fact mixed with the fervor of procession that was taken out to mark the occasion. Historic records show on this day people from both the communities had accepted drinking water from one another the hindus had put vermilion paste on the forehead of their muslim brethren while the muslims had placed caps on the heads of their hindu brothers um in fact already on the 8th of april miles irving had written uh to sir michael odwire who was the lieutenant governor of punjab uh, and who was very keen to oppress any kind of rebellion that was taking place particularly against the rawlat acts uh, he thought the rawlat acts were very very important uh to crush any form of uh, uh resentment against the british so therefore uh, miles irving had already written and uh, told him on the 8th of april that he thought 
there was something unusual happening in Amritsar because a uh, lot of meetings had taken place already uh, before that date. Uh, I, some of them at Jallianwala Bagh itself where thousands of people had gathered and one estimate says that there were at times more than 30,000 people that had got together uh, to give speeches and to hold uh, demonstrations against the, the British. But these were all peaceful demonstrations. And therefore, the 9th of April uh, was like a high point to show that the communities were all going to come together and peacefully uh, resist whatever plans the British had in to crush them. Amritsar's Deputy Commissioner, Miles Irving, had witnessed these scenes of unity and harmony, and it had instilled a sense of fear in him, primarily because of the memories of the Great Revolution of 1857 that continued to haunt the British government till date. And this was what uh, Sir Michael O'Dwyer, the Lieutenant Governor, always feared. And he wanted to crush this constantly. That was at the back of his mind that he has to crush this rebellion. This is also fueled partly by the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that the Gadar uh, Party movement activists had been coming back into Punjab. Many of them were from Punjab. And uh, the World War had just finished. So a lot of the soldiers were also coming back to Punjab. And I think people were aware that these were trained uh, uh, trained soldiers who knew how to uh, wield guns and so on. So if they wanted to get together and uh, you know uh, form a rebel uh, troop of some kind, they could do so. There was no real evidence of this. However, there was always a, a worry uh, from the side of the British that this could happen. And at the same time, in the years to follow, particularly in 1918 and beyond, uh, developments in Russia, in Central Asia, uh, this movement of revolutionaries across uh, Central Asia uh, and uh, through Turkey to other parts of Europe, adjoining parts of Europe, might have also given them, uh, might have also generated an apprehension in their minds that this, these particular incidents in Punjab might be part of a larger global conspiracy aimed against the British Empire. So there is every reason that this sort of fear, this sort of apprehensions uh, were real to the British minds. And it is interesting to find that if you go through the home political records of the British government, they again and again refer to what they call the fear of Bolshevism. That is, Bolshevism was instigating all this unrest, all this fearlessness, all this restivity among broad sections of the Indian society. And uh, again, Michael O'Dwyer keeps calling uh, Dr. Safuddin Kichlu Bolshevist because he had some education in Germany. So he thinks because Marx belongs to Germany, he settles in <laughs> Britain. So since he had his education in England and Germany, so uh, uh, he's Bolshevist. He ke keeps calling them and Russian spies and uh, that's available in his uh, this evidence before the Hunter Committee. So that's how British are looking at this whole agitation that who are organizing these. They are the people who are organizing. That's uh, fixed in their mind. The popularity of Dr. Kichlu and Dr. Satyapal had unnerved Deputy Commissioner Irving and he then sent a detailed report on the events of April 9th to Lieutenant Governor Michael O'Dyer. And on April 10th, he summoned Dr. Kichlu and Dr. Satyapal to his office for discussions. He, however, got them arrested the minute they arrived, and that too without a valid warrant. Dr. Kichlu and Dr. Satyapal were then secretly deported to a military camp in Dharmashala. It is believed that Lieutenant Governor Michael O'Dyer had given a clear indication to Deputy Commissioner Irving to execute this plan after going through his report. And when this news uh, spread in the city, people started pouring from everywhere. Uh, about, and they wanted to go to the Deputy Commissioner to further release of their leaders. Uh, as a 
the, uh, these um, uh, Dr. Safuddin Kichlu was a Kashmiri Muslim and he had large uh, Kashmiri following in Amritsar. So they all joined the procession. There were other uh, uh, men, uh, Mahasha Ratanjand, Chaudhary Bukarmal, they were re running Akhadas, they had their own followers. So all these uh, people and of course lots of artisans who were out of work, they also joined these procession uh, groups. Uh, earlier, uh, the followers reached the um, deputy commissioner's bungalow for the release of their But the military did not allow them to go very far. It stopped them near the railway bridge and this prevention angered the motley crowd. When they tried to break through the barriers, it led to violent clash between the people and the military personnel. A little later, the military started firing recklessly. This unmindful action infuriated the people even more and soon they went completely out of control. Telegraph wires were cut, railway station and banks were looted, things were set on fire. There was chaos and disorder everywhere. Soon this angry, uncontrollable and unguided mob killed five people, including a white police officer. Fifty-five people, hailing from the Hindu, Muslim and Sikh communities, had died when the military and the British police had opened fire on that day. During this time of violence, the crowd attacked and grievously assaulted an English woman by the name of Miss Marcella Sherwood. She was a missionary school teacher. She was riding her cycle and passing through the Farewala Gali during this unrestful period. The British authorities were keen to teach the natives a lesson and they were thinking of ways and means to do that. The authorities decided to deploy more soldiers from Jalandhar Thus, more than 400 soldiers arrived from the city of Jalandhar on the night of April 10. General Reginald Dyer reached Amritsar on the night of April 11. The duty and responsibility to protect Amritsar lay on his shoulders now. General Dyer, fearing an insurrection in the near future, called for a meeting with the officials soon after his arrival. Armored vehicles started patrolling the streets of the city. Militant planes kept vigil from the sky. It was announced that in the event of any untoward violent incident, the people of the city will be held responsible for the same. Rallies, meetings and processions were prohibited. People were warned that if they broke any rule, then they will be punished as per the military law. It was also announced that no one will be allowed to go out of Amritsar without the written permission from the concerned authorities. But proclamations were read only in 19 points, which form even less than half of the city. So half of the city was left untouched. So much so, uh, that uh, this poster, the proclamation was not even pasted at Jallianwala Bagh, where most of the meetings used to be held. Uh, so people in Amritsar, most of the people in Amritsar do not know about the Section 144, one thing. 13th April, that cursed day arrived at last. It was the day of Baisakhi festival. Without paying any heed to the warnings, and rules of the British government, thousands and thousands of innocent villagers and simpletons had reached Amritsar. And then there is also a cattle fair uh, in Amritsar. So people had come for that also. And 13th April being a Besakhi, a religious and cultural festival of Punjabis, especially the Sikhs and the Hindus. And lots of Sikhs from the villages come to Amritsar on 13th of April. Uh, among the six, there is a tradition to visit Golden Temple on 30th of April. So there were uh, villagers 
also who come to amritsar go to golden temple and it was also a very common tradition to relax in jallianwala bag so there were mixed kind of population in jallianwala bag at that time, on that day then it being a sunday there were others who were relaxing or playing there were children who were playing in the jallianwala bag the revolutionaries beat on their tin cans and made an announcement they stated that on the occasion of baisakhi a meeting has been organized at the jallianwala bag ground at 4:30 pm people who gathered there in large numbers preferred to talk in terms of their daily uh, instances of being left out or being discriminated rather than uh, determining uh, the prices of cattle and this also there is also ample proof that many of them went to jallianwala bag congregated there uh, from the horse ground itself to express their solidarity with fellow punjabis against the imposition of martial law and the promulgation of seditious acts in punjab now general dyer uh, thinks that this is against his orders that how dare indians they have been told that they cannot hold any meetings but he can't see that lots of people who are coming to amritsar on that day are coming for other reasons but it's fixed in his mind they are here because there is a they are going to rebel they have rebelled and they are going to attend that meeting against my orders thus without wasting any more time general dyer and captain briggs gathered the troops crossed the civil lines and headed towards jallianwala bag he reached the bag armed with 90 soldiers two armored vehicles and two police cars a narrow lane led to the entrance of jallianwala bag since it was impossible for the two armored vehicles to enter such a narrow lane general dyer left the machine guns and the armored cars on the main road and ordered the soldiers to accompany him and headed towards the jallianwala bag on foot he first blocked the main entrance gate There was a small mound near the main entrance. General Dyer stood on this mound and surveyed the inside scenario. He could see the meeting site which was not too far away. Even before one could fathom or realize what was going on, General Dyer gave the command. Fire! <laughs> प्यारा 
बाग खून से सना पड़ा है प्रिय ऋतु राज ओ प्रिय ऋतु राज किंतु धीर से आना यह है शोक स्थान यहाँ मत शोर मचाना किंतु धीरे से आना इट वॉज अनडाउटेडली अ वेरी वेरी ब्रूटल मैसेका एंड द सैडेस्ट पार्ट इज दैट टिल टूडे वी हैव नो आइडिया ऑफ हाउ मनी पीपल एक्चुअली डाइड इन इट and how many were wounded uh, because immediately in the aftermath of the massacre no effort was made to count the number of dead so there were rough estimates that were made that uh, if uh, 1670 bullets had around had been fired rounds had been fired uh, that meant that maybe if uh, you know around 300 people would have been killed but um, it had not been taken into account that many people tried to escape by uh, hiding you know there was a hansli that was a kind of a, a long drain that took the water to uh, the golden temple from the jallianwala bagh and a lot of people had gotten in there to try and hide many drowned in there uh, there is also um, uh, some suggestion that some people jumped into the well but actually that is incorrect because uh, as all eyewitness accounts uh, do not uh, point to anybody actually jumping into the well they may have fallen into the well because the well had no rim uh, around it at that time but there are uh, oddly enough no records to suggest that uh, uh, dead bodies had been fished out but perhaps there were some uh, that had uh, drowned in the well as well but most people died of uh, the bullet injuries and because they had been crushed under the weight of people who were scrambling to get out a lot of them were very very young children as uh, uh, some of them just a few months old uh, who had no hope of escaping so these are very very sad stories that come out of that massacre because these people we consider them to be martyrs today because it was only after this that the freedom movement and the freedom struggle really started in india the onslaught of brutality did not end with the massacre at jallianwala bagh on that fatal day no it was far from being over the british government in india soon declared a state of emergency and imposed military rule throughout punjab the period that followed this order was marked by violent events of suppression and oppression One of the most inhuman hallmarks of this period was the government's decree by which it forced innocent people to crawl. General Dyer had not forgotten the assault inflicted on Miss Sherwood at Parewali Gali. On April 19th, he decreed an order that stated that natives would have to crawl while traversing through the Parewali Gali. this was a very uh, terrible time for the people of punjab because these kind of brutal punishments like the crawling order like the whipping order uh, the picking up of all lawyers uh, uh, lieutenant governor odwyer had a particularly uh, you know um, had had a particular anger against the middle class especially the lawyers who were largely leading the rebellion against the raul attack and so he decided to downgrade them and uh, make them into temporary constables and a lot of the very reputed lawyers in amritsar and in other cities were forced to clean the drains sweep the uh, sweep the floors um, you know uh, uh, sort of stand in wait on any british uh, officer who might want them to do so and it all these punishments which took place
at that point what Dyer did was he imposed martial law. Uh, this was cruelty upon cruelty. Not only had people been brutally massacred, uh, Dyer also cut off electricity and water uh, in Amritsar. So there was, they, they were really helpless. They were in a terrible situation because there was no way that the blood could have been washed off the streets. There was uh, uh, no water. The, the, the electricity supply had also been cut off. Uh, there was some suggestion that the water, the well water had been poisoned, but um, how could, as somebody remarked very sarcastically at that time, how could the electricity have been poisoned? This was, these were just attempts to make the people of Amritsar suffer. And this was Dyer's main agenda. <laughs> Jungle rule was established on the banks of the five rivers. The railways were prohibited from selling tickets for the third class. There was no way that one could leave Punjab. Not more than two people were allowed to walk on the road together. The cycles belonging to natives were snatched away. Fine was imposed on the horse carts. Shopkeepers who had shot shop were forced to open their shops. The military fixed the selling price of all edible items. The barbaric and cruel measures were not just limited to the city of Amritsar alone. Unprecedented horrific cases of brutality and subjugation were also carried out in Kasur city which was located 27 miles away from Punjab's capital Lahore and even in Gujranwala. <laughs> If they felt that there was any kind of uh, riot or something, it had to be put down with a heavy hand. They had already done that in Amritsar, and now they decided that this was also going to happen in uh, Gujranwala because uh, as soon as the crowd started uh, gathering and uh, began to burn as they had in uh, in Amritsar, uh, what they thought were symbols of British power, a few buildings like the post office and so on, there was a violent retaliation. And uh, very soon, um, Sir Michael O'Dwyer gave the permission that aircraft should come into Gujranwala, should fly over Gujranwala, and uh, the, it should, uh, the aircraft should bomb uh, any, any gathering that it found and, uh, and to try and ensure that there was a suppression of any kind of rebellion that took place. This was a truly bizarre order because there was no way that any aircraft flying from overhead could make out whether the gathering was peaceful, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, whether people were out there to rebel or anything else. However, this did happen. And whilst the numbers uh, that were officially given out were very small, um, one can imagine that the damage must have been much, much larger than uh, had been estimated at that time. The people of Punjab lived in an autocratic environment where it was getting difficult for them to breathe, to stay alive. The voices of many newspapers were muzzled in Punjab since the government did not want the rest of the country to learn about the atrocities being meted in Punjab. At this juncture, special mention must be made of the Tribune, which was edited by Kalinath Roy. But once the news of Jallianwala Bagh massacre spread, a broad section of the Indian society assumed intense political hatred against the British Raj. We all know how Rabindranath Tagore renounced his knighthood. We all know how a range of Indian intelligentsia wrote 
stringent criticisms of the British reprisals. Tagore got the news of mass massacre at Jallianwala Bagh exactly one month later in Shantiniketan. This news caused him severe grief and anguish. It distressed and agitated him to no end. He could not quietly accept the news of this brutality. Tagore felt the need to take proper action. The enormity of the measures taken by the government in the Punjab for quelling some local disturbances has, with a rude shock, revealed to our minds the helplessness of our position as British subjects in India. The disproportionate severity of the punishments inflicted upon the unfortunate people and the methods of carrying them out, we are convinced are without parallel in the history of civilized governments. And these are the reasons which have compelled me to ask Your Excellency, with due difference and regret, to relieve me of my title of knighthood. The British government had formed the Hunter Commission on October 18, 1919. Lord William Hunter was its chairman. The primary job of this committee was to investigate the incidents that had taken place in Delhi, Bombay and Punjab. On October 29, the members of this committee first met in Delhi. Then they gathered data and information from Delhi Ahmedabad, Bombay and Lahore. General Reginald Dyer's hearing was scheduled to be held in Lahore on November 19. General Dyer remained rigid and unyielding even before the Hunter Committee. Be it his speech of acceptance or his body language, both reflected his arrogance and audacity. It was a horrible duty I had to perform. I think it was a merciful thing. I thought that I must shoot well and strong enough so that neither I nor anybody else should have to shoot again for the same purpose. Of course I could uh, dispose the mob without firing, but they would have come back again and laughed and should have made what I consider to be a fool of myself. The Congress on its part pointed out that in order to make the investigation bias-free, some prisoners should also be presented before the Commission. The Commission rejected this proposal. When the Congress requested the British government in India, it too did not show any interest towards this proposal. The Congress then decided to boycott the Hunter Committee and form their own independent inquiry committee comprising of the following members. Mahatma Gandhi, Deshbandhu Chitranjan Das, Motilal Nehru, Fazlul Haq, Abbas Tayabji, and the Secretary K. Shantanam. The Congress Committee, after conducting a thorough investigation, had held the incompetency of the British government responsible for what had transpired. It had stated that the arrest of Kichlu, Satyapal, and Gandhiji, the firing by the police, and the gruesome acts of terrorism that had been carried out after the imposition of military rule only reflected the weakness and incapability of the authorities to take sound administrative decisions. The importance of Jallianwala tragedy in Indian nationalist politics lies in the fact that for the first time it exposed the brutal, naked and repressive character of British imperialism. It proved that, it demonstrated that the British government had, would have no qualms in using its repressive military force to fight any form of threat or opposition that it perceived from any section of the Indian society. The brutality with which General Dyer committed the offence against an unarmed Indian public was again a precursor of many such brutalities that the British Army, the British police 
had committed on peaceful Indian nationalist demonstrators. On May 26, 1920, the 200-page Hunter Committee report was issued and it had shocked many people. The committee had condemned and stringently criticized General Reginald Dyer for the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. It had averred that Dyer had not given adequate time for the crowd to disperse at Jallianwala Bagh on that fatal day and that he should have refrained from firing the moment the crowd had started to disperse. The report had also asserted that General Dyer's intentions to teach a lesson and produce a moral effect on the crowd at Jallianwala Bagh and on the state of Punjab in general were completely wrong. Based on this report, strict action and punitive measures were taken against Dyer. However, no punishment was doled out to O'Dyer, Irving, Johnson, O'Brien, Bosworth, Smith, et al. Dyer should not be blamed entirely for this massacre uh, because we find that um, uh, the same sort of view was shared by the governor of Punjab uh, uh, who believed that uh, uh, that there should be uh, uh, an iron fist policy when it comes to running Punjab. So uh, both Michael O'Dear and Mike and Dyer, General Dyer himself, subscribed to this model that there was uh, a sort of a, a revolution um, underneath, uh, a revolution was taking place underneath and it would burst at any time. So the only way out was not a political resolution of the crisis, but rather a military solution to the impending crisis. And this explains why General Dyer had been moved in from Jalanda to Amritsar and at the same time why he was in close touch with General Michael O'Dear for commands and instructions. Soon, the focus to determine what had happened at Jallianwala Bagh in Punjab shifted from India to England, to be more precise, to the British Parliament. The then Secretary of State of War, Sir Winston Churchill, who had fervently argued that the actions of General Dyer stated in the House of Commons that according to the Army Council, Dyer had committed an error of judgment and because of that, he would now have to retire on half pay with no prospects of employment in future. Referring to the incident of Jallianwala Bagh, Sir Winston Churchill says, this is an episode which appears to me to be without precedent or parallel in the modern history of the British Empire. It is an extraordinary event, a monstrous event, an event which stands in singular and sinister isolation. After what had happened in Parliament, it was decided by the people at large that something had to be done to honour this so-called great man. and. Uh, one of the newspapers opened a fund and within days, you can say, more than 26,000 pounds, which is equivalent to many crores, I think, today, was collected. And uh, this was then given to him. Uh, undoubtedly, it did not make up for the fact that he would have felt that he had been dishonored publicly. but. Uh, it was uh, a shocking thing for many of the Indians who watched what had happened. And this sort of fundraising, they felt, was uh, totally unacceptable. The way the British government tried to shield Dyer through its official hunter committee also showed the nakedness of the way in which, the nakedness and unashamed way in which Britain can function to fulfill its own imperial needs. It also demonstrated the Indian will to fight against any British move to curtail the right to protest. So Jallianwala Bagh episode like the Raula Shottagra had far-reaching impact on the emerging Indian 
nationalist politics. Udham Singh killed the erstwhile Lieutenant Governor Michael O'Dyer at Caxton Hall on March 13, 1940. Although it is not proven, but it is believed that Udham Singh had witnessed the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh as a 16-year-old orphan and he had sworn revenge. Singh was caught and later hanged at Pentoville Prison in London on July 31, 1940. <laughs> Mainu goli maro, main vari nu maria, mainu goli maro. Hoda dabya sher ne jad hoya khadka, kaji launa pull gaye murge nu tadka. By now, Gandhiji's opinion of the British had undergone a sea change. He could not support the presence of the British in India any longer. He returned the medals he received from the British government. Soon the lines and plans for India's battle for freedom were drawn up, as Gandhiji wrote, We do not want to punish Dyer. We have no desire for revenge. We want to change the system that produced Dyer. In the meantime, the Montagu reforms had become an act. In 1919, as per the provisions of this new act, few benefits were extended towards the Indians, but the Congress rejected these on the grounds that these benefits and reforms did not uphold the nation's demand for Swaraj or self-governance. Congress members, after engaging in discussions, reached a consensus and decided to adopt the policy of non-cooperation in its working agenda. As a mark of protest against the Jallianwala Bagh massacre and in support of the Khilafat movement and complete independence, Gandhiji launched his movement of non-violence and non-cooperation all over the country. This call of Gandhiji received an overwhelming and euphoric response across the length and breadth of the country. The deaths at Jallianwala Bagh would not go in vain. It had thus paved the way for India's mass movement for freedom. As days progressed, revolutionary movements started to make its presence, felt along with the existing mass movement in both Bengal and Punjab. The leaders of this revolutionary movement were Jatindranath Mukherjee, Elias Bhagajatin in Bengal and Bhagat Singh in Punjab. Gandhiji could never forgive the British for the atrocities meted out by them at Jallianwala Bagh in 1919. He thus went on to lead India's freedom struggle and the country finally won her independence in 1947. <laughs> I have been 100 years ago, so for me, this is a frightening spirit. It was a spirit that I had to learn how to learn, how to do it. It was a revolution for the revolution. So, it was a spirit that I had to use in today's time. It was a spirit that I had to use in today's time. This is what I want to encourage. The Jallianwala Bagh was the first time of the Jallianwala Bagh. An unbelievable, unparalleled and unprecedented incident. One is not sure whether this barbarous and tragic massacre will find a mention in the annals of world history, but no one can erase it from the history of India's freedom movement. On April 13, 1919, those innocent souls who died in great pain and anguish at the hands of the British soldiers and their merciless bullets had looked at the podium at Jallianwala Bagh and dreamt of nothing but freedom and independence. 
India and Indians continue to remember and revere those unknown martyrs even today after 100 years of the Jallianwala Bagh tragedy. ये जो हिस्टोरिक इवेंट हुआ था ये कुछ लोगों के लिए सिर्फ एक स्टोरी के लिए ही रह गए हैं आज की डेट में युद्ध में स्पेशली वो फीलिंग है नहीं क्योंकि आज की डेट में सब अपना अपना देख रहे हैं इस चीज़ से हमें मोटिवेशन इसलिए मिलती है कि हमें अपने नेशन के लिए भी कुछ करना चाहिए ठीक है इंस्पाइट ऑफ थिंकिंग अबाउट आवर सेल्फ वी हैव टू थिंक अबाउट अवर नेशन ऑल्सो